Right. So moving on with topics, we looked at probability. We looked at market models, market models, which you might need if you are, for example, a And so you only approximately might know where they are. You some sensory, very noisy readings. Quick recap. So probability, what were the things we looked at? Conditional probability, this was a definition. The product rule was a consequence of this definition, just multiplying both sides by P with Y. It's interesting because it allows us to construct a joint distribution from two distributions that are in and of themselves not a joint distribution. We have a marginal over Y, a conditional for X given Y, and then together we can construct the joint distribution here. We can generalize this the chain rule, you can construct a joint over many, many variables, in this case n, by a product of conditionals. Note that you can do this for any ordering of the variables. In this case, we pick the ordering 1 through n, and then we have every factor here is the conditional of xi given all the preceding variables x1 through xi minus 1. Then we looked at properties that might become important uh, as we move along. x and y are independent even only if the joint probability of x and y is the same as the product of the probability of just x with the probability of just y. This has to be true for all values x and y can take on for independence to be true. Conditional independence was something that's a little more mild of an assumption. It's one we'll be making a lot. In fact, we've already made it in the last lecture. We're going to be making that assumption again in this lecture. And the definition here is that x and y are conditionally independent given some third variable z, even only if the following expression holds true. It's important here to see the connection with independence. So if we look at these two sets of equations, what's the difference? The only difference is that there's a conditioning on z everywhere throughout. Let's say that condition on z, x and y are independent. All right, this is our notation for conditional independence. We'll use that a lot today. So how about hidden market model? What are they? So, take a look at what Markov chains were. Markov chains had this sequence of states, and we, could, we had a model that connects the state from time t to time t plus 1. But in some sense, they're not all that useful. I mean, we saw some uses, but in many ways, they're just a build-up to what we're going to cover today. The reason being is that usually what we're interested in is some process where we don't know what's going on. We don't know the exact state, but we get some sensory measurements about that state at each time. And so that's a different model. That's a hidden Markov model. So what we have here is still the Markov model over here. But then in addition, we have observations, evidence variables, EI at each time I, that tell us something about the state at that time. We've seen this kind of graphical notation before, and we'll formalize this graphical notation on the uh, base nets. But for now, we can just look at what it intuitively means, right? We had a process here that tells us how x2 depends on x1 through some conditional probability distribution. And we now have an additional conditional probability distribution that tells us how the evidence variables depend on the state variables. So let's look at two examples. Here's a weather HMM. So here's a story. Any grad students in the audience today? Okay, so nobody's going to be offended. Um, this is story. The way the story goes, um, there is a grad student, and grad student life consists of sitting in the lab, a lab with no windows, and you're in the lab all the time, day after day after day, doing research. It's not bad. Uh, sinister. But for this story, that's the way grad student life is. Um, but you have an advisor, your professor. And every day he stops by and says hello. And he might be carrying an umbrella or might not be carrying an umbrella. And that's how you might be able to infer something about whether it's raining today or not. So that's all you know about the outside world is your professor sometimes has an umbrella, sometimes not. All right. So this is the hidden state over here. Um, it could be raining, could not be raining at time t minus 1, same for time t, same for time t plus 1, and so forth. And then the evidence you get to measure is your professor is swinging that umbrella or is not swinging the umbrella. And, well, there's some distribution there. Sometimes your professor has an umbrella even when 
it's not raining because maybe they thought it was going to rain and then they brought it along just in case. Sometimes it's raining and they forget their umbrella. So this here is a noisy measurement of whether it's raining or not. All right, so just like in a Markov model, we have an initial distribution for initial time, time one. This is whether it's raining or not at time one. Then there are transitions, same as before. Again, we'll assume those conditional probability distributions are stationary. So at all times, we use the same distribution. And then there are emissions. The emission model is a condition for the measurement of the evidence variable given the current state variable. All right, that's our first example. Um, last semester, I got a complaint from a grad student saying that it was a little too close to the truth. Um, so here's our distribution we'll be working with. So we have two tables now, one for the transitions, one for the measurements. Here's another one, a Ghostbusters hidden Markov model. So before what we've looked at is this flying base rule effectively. The growth was so very great, we didn't know where, and we were trying to discover where the growth was. Now the ghost is allowed to move around. For the ghost, which is one of nine coordinates, but we don't know what it is. We have a distribution over it initially equally likely each of the nine spots. And then the ghost can make a move. It's a noisy motion. In this example, the ghost will be kind of moving around clockwise, but in a noisy way. And we get a Depending on how close we are to the ghost, um, we'll get a different color, but it's noisy, so the color is not deterministic as a function of the distance to the ghost. Okay, so maybe initially the distribution is uniform. Usually the ghost move, moves clockwise, but not always. Sometimes they move randomly, or they might stay in place. Um, so, for example, after a measurement, maybe our distribution could look like this, and then um, the ghost could move off to the right, and we get a new distribution. And so, actually, let me restate that. Here, let's assume the ghost is actually here. In this particular square, the normal motion is to go clockwise, which is this way. The resulting distribution is showing that there is some probability at all neighboring squares. Most of it in the direction you try to move as a ghost, but not all of it. Of course, I mean, if you start with this distribution here, you'd have to compute a transition distribution from each possible starting state and then add it all up, each of them weighted by one ninth to get the distribution at the next time. All right, so this is our HMM for Ghostbusters. You'll actually look at something quite similar in your projects four. So you'll look at ghosts going around, but you're not Pac-Man anymore, you'll be Grand Pac. Grand Pac um, can't see. So Grand Pac cannot see the ghosts, but Grand Pac can still vaguely hear something. The ghost makes some kind of rumbling noise. And so Grandpa can hear some kind of rumbling noise and based on that have some vague intuition about where the ghost might be. And you will be running an HMM inference in an HMM to compute a distribution over where the ghost might be. And then you will go to where you think the ghost might be. And now Grandpa, as opposed to Pac-Man, isn't afraid of the ghost. Grandpa has a huge ghost hunting gun and just blasts the ghost when he gets near them. So that will be your job in... Um, Project 4, which will be coming out right after the midterm and will be due uh, right before spring break. All right, so the joint distribution of an HMM, what does it look like? I'm going to posit this joint distribution over here. What is that saying? I'm saying the joint distribution over all these variables is can be factored as the probability distribution for the first one, x1, then the conditional for e1 given x1, x2 given x1, e2 given x2, x3 given x2, e3 given x3. This maps with this model over here, right? Each of these variables has a conditional distribution. Conditional, where the conditioning variables are its parents. All of them have one parent, so the conditioning on the parent, and that corresponding conditional distribution is showing up over here. It corresponds to the causal process we all of us probably have in mind, where one variable causes the next one in a noisy way. More generally, we can write it this way. So we've got capital T time steps. The first time step is a little different because there's nothing before it, so I singled it out there. But then from then onwards, it all looks the same. 
conditional for xd given xd minus 1, and conditional for the evidence given the state at that time. All right, so this is the joint distribution. We have to ask some questions here, of course. Um, first thing is, does it really define a joint distribution? We asked this question last time about Markov models. We said, well, we put something really together, but it's a number, but are they going to some joint distribution? They define something else that is not a joint distribution. Um, and then the second thing we can ask is, well, now we have factors in this small number the full joint distribution over the two t variables. Um, and now we, we have just a bunch of smaller models, and if you add up how big those tables are, it's only, even if you had an individual table for each time slice, it'd still be linear in t rather than exponential. So much smaller representation than a full joint dis distribution. We cannot represent the general if we could do it with just a linear set of numbers in T. But let's look at this more more closely. So just like we did last time, we'll apply the chain rule and we'll look at the example here for just three time slices. We'll apply the chain rule in the ordering that the variables are given over here. You can do this in many other orderings, but this is the one that's useful for what we're doing here. So it's an ordering that's consistent with the way the variables are ordered over here. That's essential to make this work out. There are not too many orderings that are consistent, actually, with what we have over there. Um, we pick one that's consistent. In fact, I think there's only, there's not much you can change here in ordering, but this is the most logical one to be consistent with that graph. This is always true, this equality over here. This, not, this does not require any assumptions. Hold on, let's just happen here. Okay, now we assume something. We assume this set of conditional independences. What are they saying? This is saying x2 is independent of, x2 is independent of x1 given x1. Look at the process at the top here, all right? We're going to assume that if you know x1, more knowledge, knowing something about e1 will not tell you more about x2. That corresponds to the process we've drawn here. But formally, mathematically, this is the assumption we're making. Another assumption we're making is this one over here. We're assuming that e2 is independent of x1 and e1 given x1. Again, this corresponds to our drawing over here. Here we said that all the influence of x1 and e1 is mitigated through x2. That's essentially what conditional independence is. You're conditionally independent of these two other variables, given x1. Um, does that even make sense? There's one too many here. Can't have it on both sides. This way. So E2 is independent. Actually, we can do something better than that. This should be x2 here. All right, so what we have here is that E2 is independent of all preceding variables given X2, and that's what we set up over here. The influence is mitigated through X2. Next one, here we say that X3 is independent of all the preceding variables except for X2 given X2. And again, that's capturing that the influence of everything that comes before onto X3 is mitigated through X2. And then the last one, similarly for the evidence, E3. Once we know X3, saying anything about the four preceding variables is not giving, giving us any new information about E3. All right, so those are our four assumptions. Once we make those assumptions, what we have here transforms in this set of equations over here. What just happened is we got rid of the conditioning on E1 over here, we got rid of the conditioning on X1 and E1 over here, we got rid of x1, e1, e2 over here, and we got rid of x1, e1, x2, e2 over here. So these, these are specific assumptions. For a temporal process like this, they might be quite reasonable, um, but we need to be aware of exactly what we're doing. What we're doing, this is always available to us, 
The simplification is only possible thanks to these assumptions. You can do this more generally. So this is it laid out for a distribution over capital P time slices. Um, again, chain rule looks like this for an ordering that kind of runs left to right. Then we make the following two independence assumptions in generality. We say the state at the current time is independent of all past states and all past evidence given just the previous state. And then the second assumption we make is that the evidence at the current time is independent of all past evidence and all past states given the current state. So if the, this, these two expressions aren't immediately clear to you, at least the intuition here should be clear in these verbal statements. Once we account for those independence assumptions, things simplify, we get this expression over here. What happened is that in this one over here, the conditional independence allowed us to get rid of everything but xt minus 1. And over here, we got rid of everything behind the condition bar except for xt. All right. So then we can again ask the question, are there any implied Same thing is true here. Here's an example of an implied conditional independence. E1 is independent of all of these variables given x1. So E1 sitting over here, it's saying here that once we know x1, E1 is independent of all of these over here. It wasn't something that we explicitly assumed when we made our hidden Markov model assumptions. But any distribution that satisfies the hidden Markov model assumptions will also satisfy this property. There are many more of such properties. The last time we saw how you could do some algebra and you could then prove that, right, something of the form, the conditional of E1 given X1, X2, X3, E2, E3 is the same as the conditional of E1 given X1. By using that factorization that we have on the previous slide over here, using this factorization, knowing that the distribution satisfies this factorization allows us to do some algebra to prove additional conditional independences. This is the second approach, and we'll look at that one more closely, um, three, three lectures from now, but there's a way to just read off these additional independencies from looking at the graph. For HMMs, reading it off is not too hard to do, it just follow your intuitions. For HMMs, all you need to do to find conditional independencies is to check if two sets of variables are separated by a third set of variables. So you look at all the paths in the graph, you say, oh well, how about E1 and E3, given X2. Yes, because X2 cuts the path between E1 and E3, and hence E1 is independent of E3 given X2. And any, anything you do in this kind of graph, as long as you cut the path between two variables, whatever cuts that path will make those two variables conditionally independent. There will be some fine print later. Once the graphs are more complicated than the HMM graph, it's not just about where do you cut a path? It's a little more complicated, but for HMMs, any conditional independence can be read off just in this very simple way. Any questions about the independence assumptions we made? Can we say E2 is, can we say the following? E2 independent of E3. Is that true or not? Who thinks it's true? Who thinks it's not true? Why not true?
Yes, so the intuition here is that if you know E2, let's see, if you know nothing, right? That's the question you need to ask. If you know nothing, you have some distribution for E3 as a consequence. You have not observed anything. Now, if you observe E2, does that give you more information about E3? And the answer is indeed yes, because when you measure E2, it'll give you more information about X2, which in turn will give you more information about X3, which in turn will give you more information about E3, which means E2 and E3 are not independent. If we wanted, if we wanted an independence between them, we'll have to condition on something, find something that cuts their path. So it could be conditioned on X2 or conditioned on X3. Those are our two options to make them conditionally independent. Any other questions about conditional independence and the way we model joint distribution? All right, let's look at some real world examples just at a high level for now. This lecture will look at in detail how some of these applications work. Here would be you'd have x1, x2, x3, and so forth. You have evidence variables e1, e2, e3, and so forth. The evidence variables here would be some some speech, so it'd be some signal. So if your original signal over time maybe who knows it's going to have a lot of high frequencies in it, so maybe it'll look something like this. Then you might chunk it here, here, and here. This will be your first observation. This second slice here will be your second observation. Third slice will be your third observation. So continuous observation. We'll see more detail about how to do that next time. But that would be your observations. Then up here you'd have something like the state space would be, um, you could be, Essentially, the phonetic signs that you see when uh, people write out how you pronounce a word would be things appearing here. So maybe we'd say, ah, uh, it's not just vowels, it could be, it's not just letters or vowels, it could be more than that, but it, think of it as that for now. And since any phoneme could maybe start a word, then the first one has a prior, that's some distribution over what phoneme might be the first phoneme. A starts a word, so to say, and that And the evidence here will, of course, be maybe compatible, maybe not compatible with A, and as a consequence, 
that will become more or less likely that the state here is A. And of course, there's also a transition here. You can look at your words and you can say how often when a word starts with A, does it then follow with a P? Again, it's not just letters, it's phonemes, which we'll look at in more detail next time, but that's the intuition that you have a model here that tells you how likely it is to go from one phoneme to the next distribution. These will be big distributions, right? There's a lot of phonemes out there, tens of phonemes. You need to look at all possible combinations. Um, that's the way it's set up. There'll be an additional, often there's an additional state introduced, which is actually the word you're pronouncing. So rather than just keeping track of the phoneme, an additional part of a state will be the word that you're currently pronouncing. So I'm going to show you two quick things about a machine translation. But this for now is just um, machine translation. Again, the model will be the same. What happens here is the hidden state is, let's say, look. Russian, right? Um, if you translate it into English, English will be the hidden state. And so when you run inference in your HMM, you will infer what hidden state sequence of words corresponds to the observed sequence of words. So the emission model here is how likely a Russian word is emitted based on a certain English word. And the transition model is about what English words are likely to follow each other. Robot tracking. Um, here, typically, the way it works is um, let's look at uh, an example that pioneered which went In robotics, an uh, example that comes up a lot is robot localization and even mapping. So let's say you put a robot in a building. You have a map of the building ahead of time. Robot beams out laser, laser beams, and then measures in every direction how long it takes for that beam to come back. So that beam in that direction, it took some time to get back. Speed of light times the time it took to get back tells me what is twice the distance to the wall over there or the door. You're multiplying with the speed of light, which is a large number, to measure how far away the door is. Right? So you end up with some noise. Usually that's about two to three centimeter accuracy. You lock in your laser, correct? So you have two to three centimeter accuracy in terms of how far away that door is. It's a noisy measurement. You can get many measurements as your robot moves along. You might have a model for as the robot executes an action, what the likely next state is. Down some ramp and so forth. So again, it's a noisy model from t to t plus one. It's a noisy model from where you are to the distance you get, what distances you measure. Based on combining those in a inference procedure, you can figure out where the robot is and have a possible map as it goes along, even without having a map ahead of time. We'll look at this in more detail also next lecture. This just as motivation for why, why we care about these instruments. All right, so filtering monitoring is a standard application. Um, you start, so in this HMM, you start with some belief over the state at the initial time, and you get evidence at each time and try to keep track of the distribution for the state of the robot or whatever it is that you're tracking, given all the evidence you've seen so far. So this is the di distribution you're interested in. It's a very particular query. Right. But usually what you're interested in is distribution for the current state given all evidence that has happened, been observed so far. 
the shorthand notation for this, pt of x, is shorthand for the thing on the right. It's just notation, right? This doesn't mean anything uh, except that we just define it to mean the thing on the right. The reason the shorthand exists is because so often we're interested in this quantity. B stands for believe, the small t stands for the believe at time t, and then x is the state variable over which you have a belief. You don't know what value it actually has, you just have a distribution. In filtering slash monitoring, you start with an initial belief, B1 of x, usually uniform if you don't know anything about what's going on. As time passes, we get observations, we update B of x, often we leave even out the time index, we just say, oh, we have a B of x, and then time passes, we have a new B of x, and keep going. So this is used in the kind of rocket tracking example, which got us, or us, not literally us, but I guess humanity onto the moon. Um, let's look at a robot example. We have a robot in this maze, but the robot doesn't know where it is. Actually, the distribution is such that it's equally likely to be in any of these squares. The sensor model is such that the robot measures in all four directions, and it'll then know whether there was a wall for this configuration, for example, the robot's in a particular location. It wouldn't know it, but it's in that location. It's measuring in all four directions. If there's no noise, it would measure north of me, there's a wall. East of me, there is no wall immediately there. South of me, there is a wall. West of me, there is no wall. But the measurements are noisy, and so it can make up to one mistake in its measurements. So it could have measured that north of itself is no wall, potentially. That could be one mistake. So that's the sensor model. The motion model is that the action that the robot takes going north, east, south, or west gets executed, but with some probability it actually fails and the robot just stays in place. So see what happens if we run probabilistic inference in this model and see how quickly we can localize the robot. Keep in mind, while we're showing the robot on the slide here, that's where the robot is, the robot doesn't know that. What the robot knows is this distribution here, which is gray showing everything is equally likely. Okay, so after one step, we, we made a measurement, we got a reading, we got a reading that there is wall north and south, no wall west and east. Probabilities get updated. You can imagine how that happens, right? It's a Bayes rule kind of thing. Um, you have a posterior for the location of the robot shown by the shading of the gray. Then it moves off to the right, which will update its distribution because it knows that distribution will then shift everywhere to the right. Okay, then I'll make a new measurement. Then it'll move again, make a new measurement, move again, make a new measurement, and so forth. And you see over time things narrow down. At this point, everything seen is really mostly compatible with just two locations, here and here. I haven't seen anything that could distinguish between the two, but that was about to happen. When it moves one more, it sees no wall south of itself, so now a lot of the probability mass goes here. It doesn't know for sure it's there, it's just the most likely location based on the measurements so far. All right, let's look at the base cases that happen underneath here. The first thing that happens is somehow evidence comes in. You had a distribution for location of the robot, you got some evidence, and you updated that distribution. Okay, here's how that works. If you want the conditional for x1, given the evidence e1, we can use the definition of conditional probability, which is this expression over here. Now, next thing we do is we say, well, now we need to look at what we have available. You always need to think about what do we have. Initially, all we have is px1. And what we also have, we have the model. We know that distribution for xt given xt minus 1. And we have a model for et given xt. So when we have this expression over here, we need to think about how can we re-express this in terms of things we have available. Well, this is something useful here. And then the evidence distribution is something useful here. Together, we'll be able to form that joint distribution over here. The evidence thing at the bottom here, well, we're going to just get rid of it. Why can we do this? Why can we replace the model with just this proportionality side here? What this is saying is that I'm looking for a distribution over x1. x1 is going to vary in the table I'm going to find. The thing on the right here, things that do not depend on x1, we can discard. 
for now. Everything that doesn't depend on X1, we can discard for now. We can build that table, ignoring the terms that don't depend on X1. And we know that the only reason they were present is to then normalize and get things to sum to one. So this thing here does not depend on X1. We can get rid of it, now it's proportional, and we just know at the end we have to renormalize to account for that thing we got rid of. Anything on the right-hand side that doesn't involve X1, get rid of it, and we now have a proportional. We love for the joint distribution between X1 and E1. We can expand that using the product rule, write it this way, and now we have two factors that we have available to ourselves. We have the distribution for X1, we have the conditional for E1 given X1, so we can build this table for, in this case, we're building a table for X1 and E1. E1 is fixed though, X1 is the only variable. We build that table, we renormalize, and we have the conditional for X1 given E1. How about the time inference? X2, so what do we have available? We want the distribution for X2. Let's assume all we have is the distribution for X1, and then of course we have the model, which is Xt given Xt minus one, and the emission model Et given Xt. Okay, how do we go from here? Well, we know that we can use the product rule here to combine the distribution for X1 with the condition for X2 given X1 to get a joint over the two of them. And once we have a joint that involves X2, we can sum out the variable X1 that doesn't matter, that we don't want here. We get the distribution we want. All right, so we have, we can write distribution for, X, distribution for X2 as the sum over X1 of the joint between X1 and X2. And this joint over here, we can write with the product rule as follows. And this way we get the distribution for X2. Something we did last time to go in the market model from T to T plus one. Now what's interesting in the HMMs is that this is really all you need to do, right? All that happens when you're running filtering slash monitoring is you go from your distribution at time t to your distribution at time t plus one. We've called it one and two here, but the same thing will happen to go from t to t plus one. And the same thing will happen whenever you get up, whether it's at time one or at time t, you have to perform this update over here. You'll have some current distribution for xt based on all past evidence, and then you'll introduce the new evidence update that distribution. All right, so let's spell this out more explicitly. We have a belief for time t, which remember is the distribution conditioned on all evidence so far, and time passes. So we now want the distribution for xt plus one given all evidence. This notation here, e1 through t, stands for e1, e2, and so forth till et. Okay. What do we do? Time passes. We saw in the previous slide what to do when time passes. We already have a distribution for time t. What we're going to do is we're going to construct the joint over xt and xt plus one. And then we're going to sum out over xt to get rid of xt. All right? But now we do have this extra stuff here that we didn't have on the previous slide. Just fine. We know in any of these probabilistic reasoning exercises, if you stop extra stuff in the back behind the conditioning bar, and you consistently keep it around everywhere, that's fine, the same equations will be true. So all we're doing is have that extra stuff in the back, and we go through the same process. This is effectively the joint between xt plus one and xt, and we sum out over xt, and we have the extra evidence in the back. It's important because we want it conditioned on the evidence, but mathematically, it's not all that different. Um, now we write it in terms of things we have available. This is something we had available from our computation so far. This is actually something we don't have available. There's no table telling us xt plus one given xt and all the evidence. Or is there? Well, we actually have a conditional dependence assumption telling us that once we know xt, the evidence doesn't matter anymore in terms of our distribution for xt plus one. So we can simplify this to something we do have available. And now we have our update equation to go from time t to t plus one. So, well, you'll do a lot of these exercises and hopefully we'll um, actually ask you to, you know, we'll give you an HMM that's not a standard HMM, for example, looks similar to your HMM, but not the same. And it will say, what's the passage of time rule now? So just want to step through this again, just to make sure it's 100% clear. What actually happened? 
We were given this. This is a given. And we also have, so we're given this, and we also have the distribution for xt plus 1 given xt, and the distribution for et given xt. Those are our givens. We somehow want to go from this to that, only using our givens, to go from a distribution over one variable to one that involves another variable. The, the way we introduce that other variable is by making it a joint between the two variables. That's the way we can introduce that extra variable. And then we sum out the variable we want to get rid of. That's what's happening in this first step over here. Right? That's a way to introduce xt plus 1 into something that likely in the future will contain this thing over here. Then the next step, so the next step here is looking at, well, these quantities here, what can we do with them? Often you don't know ahead of time what to do. I could have done many things here. I could have just as well gone from here to the um, x t given x t plus 1, comma e1 through t times p x t plus 1 given e1 through t. Both of these are equally valid steps. They're really the same. I just switched the roles of x t plus 1 and x t, but there's nothing specific about them. Both are equally valid steps. If you pick this one, you'd realize you get stuck because you hit a set of quantities here that you don't have a way to make available based on the givens you have over here. So this leads you to a dead end. It might be the first thing you try. You made the wrong decision. You had this thing over here. You said, well, I can go here or here. What am I going to try? You try this. You realize, oh, this doesn't work out. These quantities are not available to me. Dead end. Then try the other thing, which is what we actually tried. You look at this. You say, well, this is nice because this thing I have available, that's a good start because I want to use something I have available. This thing you're still stuck with, something you don't have, but the conditional independence assumption we make is that we can get rid of this over here and now we have something we do have. So keep this in mind when you do this yourself. Often there's multiple options available to you and you somehow need to have an intuition or exhaustively search till you find the one that leads you down the path where you can express things in terms of things available to you. An expression at the end here, for example, if you ended up with this thing over here and say, hey, that's my update equation, that's not valid because none of these quantities are available to you. So it cannot be your update equation for your algorithm. All right, so that's the first update equation. More compactly written, you can write it this way over here. And you have to believe at the next time, t plus one, but with this prime over here, what that means is it's the belief at the next time before at the next time we have seen the evidence. So we haven't seen e t plus 1 yet. That's what that prime over here means. b prime x t plus 1 is probability distribution for x t plus 1 given the evidence from 1 through t. In contrast, b x t plus 1 would be the distribution for x t plus 1 given the evidence from 1 through t plus 1. So they're not the same. That prime actually means something. It's you almost have to believe, but not fully yet. Okay, so this is just a shorthand notation for what we had on the left. Okay, so what happens here is the beliefs kind of get pushed through your transition model. Your transition model tells you where how probabilities kind of transfer over to the next time. Okay, here's an example of what could happen. Let's say your ghost is living in this grid over here. You don't know where the ghost is, or in this case, the probability maybe is quite likely to be over here, but you're not 100% sure. That ghost is moving clockwise, so it's kind of going through this kind of motion, but noisily. And so you can see what's the distribution at the next time. It's what you could do with a Markov model, right? This propagating through the next time is exactly what we did with Markov models. We can keep doing this as time goes by. What you see is often what will happen is if you don't get any measurements, the distribution will become more and more diffuse and more and more wave will spread out and you will know less and less about where the ghost might be. Of course, measurements will fix that, but if you have no measurements, we saw last time that actually you lose all information. Typically, you end up in a stationary distribution that's independent of where you start. Okay, so all might be lost at the end. Um, let's take a break here. And after the break, we'll look at how to incorporate evidence. 
uh, restart the first half of lecture. Okay, let's look at incorporating observations then. So you're running your ghost hunting device and you now get an observation. We've seen the base case where you have just a state of time one, observation of time one. We're going to generalize this to any time t plus one. You just did your update going from t to t plus one. Now additional evidence is coming in at time t plus one. You want to incorporate this to get an updated belief. All right. So after the evidence comes in, here's what we do. We want this distribution over here. X t plus one given all evidence. Just as a reminder, this notation here, E1 through T is evidence variables one, two, up to time T. So we want it up to time T plus one now. What's the first step? Well, we need to somehow, I guess we'll use it, maybe the definition of conditional probability would be a reasonable thing to do, right? What's the condition of X T plus one given the evidence? So here's what we'll do. We'll keep this stuff that we already had in the back, right? Actually, let me take one step back here. What are we after, right? We're after something, some expression that involves this thing over here, that involves potentially xt plus one given xt, and potentially et plus one given xt plus one. I mean, we know that this is not going to be involved, actually, but we would be allowed to use it if it were useful. Our intuition tells us we're going to have to work with these two, somehow get an updated equation that only involves those two. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we know how to do it when there is not this additional junk in the back. And we know the additional junk in the back, I mean, it's not really junk, it's good evidence, but mathematically, it's just some stuff to carry around. Let's just keep it around in the back as if it doesn't exist for now and do what we did when it wasn't there. When we start from xt plus one and we get evidence, we write out the definition of conditional probability. This is just the extra stuff, which was also sitting here, together with some other stuff, namely et plus one, but we took that out. And so this is just definition of conditional probability with some extra stuff in the back everywhere, e1 through t. Okay. Now, again, we're interested in a distribution over x t plus one. What that means is that on the right-hand side, anything that does not depend on x t plus one, we can get rid of, we don't have to worry about. We can adjust for that at the very end. We know that everything that does not depend on x t plus one is just there to make things sum to one. This here is just here to make things sum to one. So let's just get rid of it, and we say it's not proportional. And keep in mind, we need to renormalize at the end. Okay, now how do we get it in terms of the two terms that we have over here? Um, well, we have something with x t plus one given e one through t. So that gives us a hint of how we might want to factor this, because we know we can write this as x t plus one given e one through t, and then e t plus one conditional on everything else. So we do that. Right? We recognized that we could get this term out, and we did, and then this is what we're left with up front. How about the term up front? We don't have it available, but our conditional dependence assumptions tell us that the probability for the evidence that t plus one, given all of this, is the same as if you just had x t plus one. So let's simplify this. Now we get something we do have available to ourselves with our full update equation. All right, more compactly, you can go from the B prime for x t plus one, and the colors match here, right? The blue expression is the same everywhere, the red expression is the same everywhere. So the B prime x t plus one is the belief before you get the evidence at time t plus one, times the probability of the evidence at t plus one, given x t plus one, together is enough to compute a table that we then renormalize to get out the belief for x t plus one. Okay, so effectively what's happening is that you have this belief before you incorporate the evidence, you reweight every entry in that belief by how compatible it is with your evidence. That's what's happening here. You're reweighting each entry in your belief, B prime, by how compatible it is with the evidence, and then you renormalize. All right, 
So what happens in the ghost example is once you get these observations, things will narrow down again and things will concentrate. So you started maybe with a fairly not uniform, but highly distributed distribution, very diffuse. After the observation of orange over here, you get this distribution here, which is more concentrated, and you have a higher peak, so to say, in a particular location or locations around it. All right. The weather HMM. What happens if we apply this to the weather HMM? Our initial belief looks like this. Then we apply the time update. We go the next time, P prime. Um, let's put the tables on there so we can see what's actually happening. We apply the time update. I'm not going to step through this in detail, but you can verify that indeed you end up with these numbers over here. Then you apply an observation update. You get the next belief. You apply a time update, observation update, and so forth. That's what happens for inference in an HMM. Again, a B, B prime, and so forth. All times are just using the update equation. You have time updates, measurement updates, and they just kind of interleave. There's another way to derive a similar set of update equations, and we'll do that now, which are equivalent. Which is a different way of getting to essentially the same thing. Um, the are slightly different, but at the same time, it's kind of the same. Let's say you're interested in disbelief over here. And we're going to just start from scratch. We're not going to do it the way we did it before. We do it in terms of the one at the previous time. We're just going to start from scratch and then see how it falls out in terms of the ones at the previous time. So we're interested in this over here. That's proportional to the joint. Again, what's going on here is we're saying, look, um, Really, we should be dividing by the probability of the evidence from 1 through t to get an equality. But that term does not depend on x. x is the only variable, right? We're computing a distribution over x. So anything that doesn't depend on x, we can get rid of and normalize at the end. All right, after we do that, we're going to rewrite this. The join between x, t, and e1 through t, we can write it as follows summing out over x t minus 1, because we want to get it in terms of something at x time t minus 1. Then we can write this out in terms of things we have available, right? So we have a joint between x t minus 1 and the evidence up to time t minus 1. Then we have x t given x t minus 1 and e t given x t. Technically, if we did this derivation in more detail, what we'd have here, we'd have in addition e1 through t minus 1, and we'd have an addition here, x t minus 1, and e1 through t minus 1. But those disappear, because once we have x t minus 1, this doesn't do anything anymore for x t, and once we have x t here, these don't do anything anymore. So we kind of skipped a step here, but that's what happened. Now I have it in terms of quantities that we have so far, except that here we don't have a conditioning bar, we have a comma, um, but can we, we can reorganize, bring this up front, and we get a new algorithm here, which is called the Ford algorithm, which tells us how to go from the distribution for xt minus 1 jointly with e1 through t minus 1 to xt jointly with e1 through t. So we're not going from conditional to conditional here, we're going from joint with the evidence to joint with the evidence. X is your only variable. You renormalize, get out the condition for X given the evidence. So this is an alternative way of doing the same thing. Once we start generalizing our HMM to more complicated graphs that are not of that regular pattern, the item we'll see then will be a generalization of what we look at over here. Okay, so we have different ways of doing this now. Um, the online belief, of, we have this over here. We also have the online belief updates, um, which separate out time and evidence. Um, why might you prefer the one over the other? It really depends on what, what you're doing with your implementation. One thing that does matter though in practice is that if you work with this representation over here, if you don't renormalize, often your numbers will become very small over time. Because the joint of xt with e1 through et, if e1 through et and t is very large, 
looking at the joint probability over many, many variables, and so the numbers will get very, very small. So in practice, working with this joint can be a little tricky, and often you need to renormalize no matter what. Okay. So at this point, we have two ways of running out of the all right. If you look at what's going on in these updates, you have a summation over x t minus one here. So you need to do something for every value x t minus one can take on. If you have a robot that could be in any of many locations, you might be summing over a lot of values here. Um, so this could be expensive. Same thing here. You have to do a computation for every possible location the robot could be in or every possible state your system could be in in general. The weather example, rain versus sun. is really large. All right, it's going to be an approximation. So think of it this way. I'm not necessarily giving you a full probability of this location of a robot. You just get a few plots on the map and say you might need to do that out of here. The plots are not necessarily representative of where you might be. Uh, based on just a bunch of samples placed on your map. So that's what we're going to do. It's called the particle filtering. It's an approximate way of keeping track of a distribution. Looking at these examples here, keep in mind, if you just have nine possible locations, as fits on the slide here, don't use particle filtering, right? No use for state split of size nine to use particle filtering. Think of it as just a toy example that illustrates the concept. So we're going to think of millions, if not billions, of possible states, and that's when this becomes useful. Okay, so sometimes your state space is too large to use exact inference. It will make approximations. It might be that your state space is so large you can't even store a distribution. That you need so many entries in that distribution, you can't even store a table of that size. Okay. Especially when your state space is continuous, that's going to be the case. You cannot store a number for every possible continuous coordinate somewhere. It's infinitely many. All right, so the solution is going to be to make an approximation. Of course, only make the approximation if it's necessary, if we can't do it exactly right. Um, what we're going to do is track samples of the state. So we're going to switch the paradigm. The original paradigm was for every possible value in B, we have a number. A bunch of values. In this case, in this representation here, we'd be storing if our coordinate system is, let's say, um, one, two, three, one, two, three, and let's say this was one, three, then we would store something of the form two, three, then we'd have three, two, we'd have another three, two, and then we'd have a two, one, another two, one, then we'd have a three, one, another three, one, another three, one, another three, one, and another three, one. So we'd store this is what we'd store. In this case, we're storing all the numbers. Uh, I have a question. And so you're storing the representative locations that, and some of them might have more than one time being stored because it's more representative of where things might be. So that's the representation we're going to be working with. So everything in storage will look like this. This will not exist. The actual distribution will not explicitly exist. Okay, so we have a list of particles that, that correspond each of them to states, but not every state needs to appear. For some states don't appear at all in the list of particles. All right, so particle is just a name for a sample. It's some kind of sample. You can think of it as samples of your distribution. If you have enough samples of a distribution, usually it represents the entire distribution pretty well. If you have a small number of samples, it's only a crude approximation. Nice thing is that you can 
depending on how many cycles you have available, you can have more samples or less samples. If you have time to work with more samples, you can be more accurate. All right, so representation is now in the form of particles, shown over here. We approximate the distribution by a number of particles with values, right? So the more particles, the more accuracy. And for now, we don't weigh the particles. All of them have equal weight. You can ask yourself questions, right? Given this set of particles, which is also shown over here, if I were asked, what's the probability of the ghost being over here? A reasonable thing to do would be to say, well, there are 10 particles, two of them are over there, so I'm going to estimate it as 2 over 10. Right. Doesn't need to be exact. The particles might not have an exact representation of the tree distribution, but that's a reasonable way to use your particles to get out probabilities. Just look at the counts. All right, so now what happens if time passes? You're in your HMM inference procedure, you go from time t to t plus 1, we need to somehow incorporate that transition model. This approximate version is actually a lot simpler than the exact version. All we're going to do is for each of these particles, and let's grab the green one over here, we grab our particle at time t, we push it through our transition model, which is a distribution for next time given current time. Current time here would be 3, 3. We sample from the distribution for next time given current time, and it ends up landing over here. And we do that for each of the particles. So we cycle through all particles, and then use this transition model to sample, essentially simulate that noisy transition, and that gives us our new particle for the next time. So this is just simulation where you follow your noisy transition model as you simulate. All right, so that's time. Very straightforward. Um, how about observations? Remember in observations, effectively we multiply it to believe with the probability of the evidence for each state, and then we renormalized, right? We're going to do something very similar here. We're going to now give our particles weights, and we're going to multiply, I mean, the weight is essentially one initially, and then we set it to the probability of the evidence that we observe. So 3, 2, which is over here, is very compatible with the measurement red. The probability of red, given you're on top of the ghost, is 0 0.9. And so we get a factor of 0 0.9 here. How do we get the 0.2 here at 2, 3, which is over here? Well, it's saying that the probability of measuring red, given that you are two squares away from where the ghost is, right, because this particle is over here, if the ghost is here, what's the probability of measuring red over there? That probability is 0 0.2, and so forth. So that's what all of these are. It's always the probability of the evidence Given that particular particle state, assuming that particle is right about the state, how likely is the evidence you're observing? Again, very simple. You loop through all your particles. Look up the table. What's the probability of that particular evidence? Put that next to the particle. Now we have a set of weighted particles. A natural way, if you want, were to ask now a question: What's the probability of, let's say, the ghost being here? which is at 3, 1, which is we have one particle over there with a weight of 0 0.4. We would say the probability of the ghost being at 3, 1 is 0 0.4 divided by the sum of all of these weights. Sum over all the weights, Wi, is what goes in the denominator, and that's been the probability of being over. Okay, so we know how to do a time update. We know how to do a update. It's a reasonable argument. Um, what's still missing? If we know what's going on, um, what we talked about in the beginning is we have this huge thing. We want to focus our, our company. We don't want to focus on our And what's happening here is if you think about where our computation is happening, if we now did a new time update, right? We could do a noisy simulation of each of these particles, get them at the next time, and they would keep their weight. And then you do measurement update again, you multiply the new weight with the old weight, and they all get weighed down. That works in principle, but you are not focusing your computation where you need it to be. Where the particles are is just in what the particles are, where the particles are, just 
doesn't move them around. But so what that means is that, well, whether something is really unlikely, like over here, or is still quite likely or even more likely over here, it's not somehow adjusting where your particles are to where really most of the action is. So that's the last step we have to do to make this a practical algorithm here, called resampling. So once you have your weighted samples, rather than propagating your weighted samples, you resample. You think of this here, as defining a distribution over particles, right? If you look at this here, this is a table. You have 10 particles. It's a, not a normalized distribution, but if you normalize it, you get a distribution where each of these rows has some probability. For the first row, it'd be 0 0.9 divided by the sum of all of them. And you can sample from that table 10 times, and you get a new set of particles and that's what you get over here. So that's the process. You normalize this table over here and then sample from it. What does that do? If a particle is high weight at the top here, it will likely be more likely to be sampled. It might even be sampled multiple times. That's possible. For example, over here we have the green one was sampled twice. We end up with five particles over here. The way we sample because we sample according to this distribution over here, we already account for the weights. So we don't need to weight the particles anymore here. A particle that has a high weight is just going to be sampled more often, and so it's going to appear more often over here, so we can get rid of the weights after resampling. All right, that's the process. Any questions about this process? This is on the next slide. So here's a summary of the entire process. The first thing that happens is you, as time elapses, this is essentially noisy simulation. You just grab each particle, push it through your noisy transition model, see where it lands at the next time. Then a measurement comes in. As a measurement comes in, you reweight the particles, and the way you reweight them is by the probability of the evidence. So if I look at this thing over here, this weight comes from the probability of evidence at time t, let's say that's your current time, so let's equal red given the state xt equals 3, 2. This one here is a probability that the evidence equals red, given the state equals 2, 3. Next one, probability of the evidence being equal to red, given the state is equal to um, 3, 2 again, and so forth. This thing over here, these numbers you look up in your table. You have this table, probability of the evidence, given the state. You can go look that up over there. And that's where you get these numbers. I will say, I mean, I said a lot of people are really large. You might argue, well, how do we even have a table then um, if the state space is so large? But often you'll be able to encode that table by a very compact function that is not an explicit table. And so you can actually compute this pretty quickly, even though the state space is very large. Yes. For now, we assume that somebody gives us the observation model. So when we're given the HMI, we're given the model, we're going to have the observation model. see how to get those from the table. All right, so that's how we get the weights. Now, the last step is to resample, which means we think of this as a distribution. This is a distribution over 10 values, and we sample from that distribution to get a new set of particles, a fresh set of particles. Things will happen, right? Like, for example, there's no particle here. 
using these new particles, the probability that you estimate for that spot is zero. We're not exact. We're going to be making approximations. The reason you're happier with this than with these weighted parts is because now we have five particles over here. If you push these five particles through your noisy transition model, the next time, by pushing through five particles, will be more representative than if you only have three particles. That's typically what's happening. You want to have enough particles where the probability is high, so you can nicely cover what's happening at the next time with your noisy transitions. And then the process just repeats, and you keep going. Okay, we can make this more complicated. We call dynamic base nets. Um, you have something like this, where now you have two ghosts, two evidence variables, and then you have a model where things point to what's going on here as you build this, right? And P, one, two, and so forth. Same meaning as we had before, right? We have the same thing here. What this means is that we have a distribution for the ghost that we label the A ghost at time two given and once oops we look at the parents here of the particular ghost which is it depends on the a ghost at time one and the b ghost at time one what the state of the a ghost at time two will be so we have now two conditional distributions just like we had before of each variable, given its parent variables in this graph. So it's like an HMM, just a slightly different structure, but the same kind of process. You can show the same things. You can show the same thing if you look at the chain rule in an order that's consistent with the variables in this graph, and then you assume that you know variables, the effects are mitigated through their parents. That's your conditional independence assumption you can define a joint distribution with these conditional probability distributions that we get just from a variable given its parents. Okay, that's a dynamic business. We'll look at that in some more generality in the future, but they're really like HMMs and everything else that we looked at goes through here too. You can do exact inference. You can do a generalization of the forward algorithm, which you can try to derive on your own. Um, you can get probabilities out the way we've looked at before. Um, you can also do particle filtering. And in fact, that's again the simpler thing to do. What would that mean? You just initialize with some particles. As you elapse time, you simulate through this noisy transition model for each ghost from the current particle, where would they land? And then you reweight, in this case, an entire sample by the likelihood of the evidence. That's the one thing to keep in mind here is that a particle Something like this is a single particle. A single particle has locations for both ghosts. And that single particle can be evaluated how likely it is to get the evidence one, the evidence two, multiply those together, giving you the joint probability of the evidence given the state encoded by that one particle. So that's one thing to keep in mind here. Um, after that, you Reweighted them, you resample, and you just repeat the process. Here's one example where you can see how your state space can get very large, right? Let's say you have 10 ghosts, each can be in 10 locations. Now you have 10 to the 10 possible states, even for a grid with just 10 locations, right? And so if you run this particle filter, you just keep track of a few samples that are representative where the ghost might be. You can do this tractably as opposed to exact inference, which is becoming tractable for even just a moderate number of ghosts. All right, that's it for today.